Hi, everybody. Welcome to our ARIA, uh, well, Canada, right? Because we have Vancouver and Toronto chapters. We joined together and uh, have this uh, great events to all the realtors, you know, like BC or within, or, you know, within the ARIA family. Or if you're not ARIA family yet, join us afterwards, okay? So uh, first of all, uh, you know, like we would like to, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Tina Mack from Coal Banker. I've been in the business in Vancouver since 1992. So uh, Aria Vancouver's founding president. So I'm gonna, you know, like go, let, go, uh, let it go to uh, Stephen Chow. Stephen, who you are, who are you? <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Chow. I'm the uh, uh, president currently for the Aria Toronto chapter. And um, I'm actually also a Century 21 owner um, in Canada, in Toronto, uh, one of the uh, second largest owner and president of the company. And today in Toronto, we have a few of our board of directors uh, following us. Um, Winston Chan, it's a, a part of Hello. our board of vice president. Uh, okay. Shirley Yi is part of the Toronto board as well. And she's been talking today with Ivan. Um, I'll pass it back to you, Titina. Okay, so we have our board here, obviously, Sadi, uh, Sadi Minachi is our uh, president, current president. And then uh, we have Liza here, Lisa here, and then uh, Monica, um, Dennis, you know, like, thank you for everybody, you know, uh, uh, to help out with all this. And so that uh, now we would like to, we just did the shout out to the Americans, the leaders. So now I would like to have James Wang, James, our national president, to just do a little bit of the ARIA commercial, okay, if you allow us to yes. do that, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Steven. And thank you, Sadi, for uh, putting this all together. Hello, ARIA Canada. Uh, we from ARIA, the U.S., just your neighbors on the South, uh, have not forgotten about you. And we actually were looking so forward to seeing everyone at the Global Luxury Summit. Uh, uh, just uh, would have been a couple weeks, but now we're going to be doing it virtually. So hopefully everyone will be able to attend. Uh, you, you do, it is free for members. But if you join uh, right now, it's uh, less than $25. It's $24.75. I know. You can see a fabulous virtual program on, the, on April 29th, starting at 12 o'clock uh, PST time. And we have a great uh, speaker list going over luxury, going mortgage, uh, talking about commercial. We will have Andrew Yang. Uh, one of the first Asian presidential candidates speaking, uh, NAR's president, uh, Vince Malta will be on. So a fabulous group. So I encourage everyone uh, in Canada to, to virtually get on to the Global Luxury on April 29th. So yeah. it's very exciting. And on the commercial end, we will have the CCIM national president, our global president, uh, Eddie Blanton speaking. We will have a representative from ICSC. So if everyone's curious about what is going on in retail, right? Everyone is like wondering what's going on. How, what are the changes? Uh, we will have representatives from ICSC. Also uh, uh, somebody from, uh, what do you call it? Rick Sharga from uh, auction.com. He worked for 10X, a, a good person to talk about distress, auction, what's happening on in the economy when it comes to opportunities that could be happening in this market. So I'm really excited. Uh, for the virtual global luxury, and I definitely am welcoming my ARIA Canadian family to be involved and join ARIA and yes. uh, belong to our big family that we have. And I know everyone here, we, we, we just care about each other. It's yeah. really important that we all stay connected, like with the high tea event. This is what ARIA is all about, is, is family. the family aspect. So I really encourage everyone, stay connected, be involved and join ARIA and you will find this big family environment. I know many on here, boy, we've been seeing each other more than ever now, now that there is no, <laughs> there is no geographic location. We can just jump on. I know Winston and many of us, Tina, and yes. many, oh, we are just seeing each other nonstop. I think we're yeah. seeing each other like every day now. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. So ho hopefully everybody you. have their tea ready so that you yes. know cheers. cheers cheers here we go thank you so our high tea uh, time gonna start with the two wonderful lawyers 
Ivan C is from Vancouver and Shelly E is from Toronto. And then we're gonna go through a lot of, uh, you know, like questions that a lot of us, we actually want to know. And uh, so Ivan and Shelly, do you want to just have a one minute introduction of yourself <laughs> so that we can get into the meat? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone sure. Thanks for attending. Uh, I know that it's tough for everybody out there and I'm appreciative of uh, area organizing this for all of us. Uh, my name is Ivan C. I'm a lawyer. I've been doing real estate law for 26 years. I do both commercial and residential, so purchases and mortgages, financing, development, um, litigation as well, and helping with uh, corporations and um, doing investments as well as partners investing in real estate. So thank you very much. Great. So Shelley, please. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for welcoming us into your respective living rooms, bedrooms, offices, wherever you are. Um, my name is Shirley Yi. I am a lawyer practicing in Ontario, spe more specifically in the GTA area for the last 33 years, um, with a strong emphasis on real estate. Now, a lot of um, folks think that I'm from Singapore, and I'm Singaporean, but I'm really not. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong, uh, immigrated to Canada in the 60s, and uh, I've been here um, ever since. And I look Great. forward to sharing with everyone um, all our experiences and uh, whatnot right now. Okay, great. So let's get started. So everybody is now at home. That's why we can do all this Zoom meeting. So the first question is that during this COVID-19 state of emergency, we are semi-lockdown, okay? Some places lockdown, some places are semi-lockdown situation, but we, our real estate is still considered as the essential service. So can Ivan and Shirley let us know that in Ontario and in Vancouver, what is open and what is not open and how does it, uh, how does this uh, interrupt our transactions, and things like that. So Ivan, would you like to start? Yeah, so in uh, BC, the, the real estate industry is still considered an essential services, lawyers, uh, real estate agent, uh, the land title office, everything is still open. Uh, there's all these cautions in terms of social dis distancing rules. So a lot of lawyers have a lot of uh, protocols in place and how to operate remotely and how to see clients by video conference. There are all of these things that I can talk about later, but all that's open. When it comes to real estate, you have to know in BC, there are some things that are really harder than ever before. Uh, for example, if you have real estate deals that need a court order sale, if you have a foreclosure action on behalf of a client, a foreclosure, all these court proceedings, any land related deals that has to relate with the court, that's suspended. Uh, that is that the courthouse has only uh, capacities for urgent matters in which a lot of these real estate deals are not considered urgent in the eyes of uh, the uh, Supreme Court and the court services here in BC. So you have anything dealing with it. However, in litigation, there are some courts that are held by video conference, which is still operable. The Civil Resolution Tribunal in DC can hear strata disputes. They can still do everything remotely. They've always been done, doing that on, on video conference. Uh, we have small claims court uh, deals. It, it relates to real estate up to a maximum dollar figure of 5,000. That's still done by the Civil Resolution Tribunal, and that's all done by video conference. Um, the, the, another question is about uh, when it comes to real estate, limitation periods, uh, builders lien up for anyone dealing with constructions, limitations are not suspended uh, because they can still be filed and without having to actually attend and appear in court. Um, so anything that you can file, you can still file, you just can't attend to court to get a judge to hear applications given grant order. That's a good rundown and stuff. But, um, um, and one more thing, residential tenancy board, they're still open um, for urgent matters, but um, in a lot of cases that we can talk about this later on, when it comes to uh, uh, cases where you have a purchase and sale contract completing and there's a tenancy and the requirement is to give vacant possession. Uh, the tenancy board is still open. I can talk a little bit more about that. You make an application, but there's other issues about, well, what if you do, what can you do about it? So I can, we can talk about that a little bit more, but those are our basics in terms of uh, real estate industry, construction workers, construction still considered an essential service. So supply is still going coming into the system. The demand is still there. The closing procedures is causing a lot of problems. We can talk about that, but everything is still in business for real estate, it's, except for the caveat, everybody's taking precautions. Open houses, um, there's a, you know the idea of having many people at a house, not a good thing. There's advisory for the real estate industry in BC to not conduct open houses. 
do what you can to do market a um, market your product uh, virtual through virtual means. Um, uh, but so far, limit the numbers of people at a time into that open house if you do decide to do so. Great. Yeah. So uh, now, everybody, if you would like to have uh, you know ask any questions, please write on the chat, and uh, and then uh, we will you know like now let's go to Shelley. Was open in Ontario and was not. Well, I would like to ditto what Ivan has said. Uh, it's almost identical. The only major difference here is that the uh, landlord and uh, tenant tribunal, that's closed. So for all intents and purposes, uh, there are no evictions based on non-payment of rent. But for other issues dealing with safety or any um, illegal activities, the board is still holding uh, virtual hearings. So I think that's the major difference. Um, other than that, it is uh, for real estate anyways, and also uh, the essential service of, um, of uh, practice of law is basically business as usual, but under very unusual circumstances that we're practicing in right now. So when we're talking about unusual practicing, can you share yes. with us that, you know, like how, how are you going to do signing? Is it electronic signing? Do you have to still see each other it's like in the balcony? Hi, or you know, through a balcony, through a <laughs> underground parking, whatever. Okay, so Ivan, would you like to kickstart that? Yeah, it's been very interesting. Uh, during the last uh, three or four weeks in, uh, since the pandemic was uh, declared in British Columbia, um, as things progressed, Things were done differently, and the land title office and the law society, they did, with the courts, they developed different protocols as the situation progressed. Um, at the very beginning, they were only allowing counterpart signatures for different um, um, land title documents. So counterpart means I sign my side, the other side signs theirs, we put it back together, so we're not passing sheets back and forth. We can still do the signing, but it still has to be in person. You still have to see the person uh, who's signing the document. So, you, and I've done these for depending on the accommodation to my clients. I, I, I know a lot of good parking lots all throughout lower uh, the lower mainland. Um, we meet on our cars. We do dashboard signings. We have people in their houses um, looking outside, setting a table. We open the trunk of the car. They sign. They leave everything there. We don't open the package till the next day. But I videotaped everything. We still follow the client identification rules. They stand there, they hold up their ID, they take a video, and look at the, they take off their mask. We do all these kinds of things to protect. I have clients that are okay with coming to my office. I sterilize everything down. We wear our masks. We stay on opposite ends of the boardroom. We sign. Um, we do that as usual, but um, it's been very difficult. And uh, a lot of clients, especially when uh, they're elderly, they don't want to leave the house period, not even in their cars, not even in the parking lot. Um, we've done this route where I, in BC, and it's a lot, I'm not sure about this is in Toronto, but we have something called an affidavit of execution. And I've done this for several meetings where the, the realtor, uh, they are familiar with the client. They know them, they know their signatures. We, I do the video signing with my clients on video, through Zoom, WeChat, or WhatsApp. They know all the documents they sign. There's a couple of documents they need to sign in front of me. They sign in front of me, but um, the realtor who knows the client, invariably there's been a few situations like that. I meet the realtor in person, maybe in our cars. It did happen a few times, sometimes in my office. But the realtors and the people who know the people who are signing, they sign an affidavit of execution, confirming that they are familiar with the person who signed, that it is their signature. And and then identify them all with age, birth, and that is And then we accept that at the land title office. To this point in time, the land title office still requires some in person documents to be signed. For example, the transfers on the mortgage. And that's causing a bit of difficulty. I'm still waiting for it to be completely remote, um, but it hasn't happened yet. Thanks. So, Shelley, uh, yes. how, how different is it yeah. in Ontario? Yeah, yeah we're, we're a little bit lucky here. In, uh, in Ontario, our um, signing procedures have been relaxed somewhat. Uh, guidelines have been uh, issued by our law society indicating that we can sign virtually. Um, so there's um, no longer the need to have actual um, original documents. Um, so most of my signing are conducted in two ways now, either by virtual, we can also swear declarations um, through virtual um, communications also, that's not an issue. 
Uh, for individuals who cannot um, handle the technology, we are still entertaining uh, face to face signups, of course, with the uh, requisite um, precautions. Uh, my clients will be requested to wear a mask, uh, don gloves. Uh, we sanitize the areas that they have touched. Uh, we're very careful as to you know what documents they um, present to us. Uh, we enforce uh, stringent um, hand washing uh, the whole nine yards. Um, so in Ontario, in effect, it's actually made things a lot easier because uh, I do have a lot of international clients, say uh, from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, and they've always requested virtual signing. And I was never able to accommodate them on that aspect. But now with the relaxation of the uh, signing requirements, things have actually become a lot simpler on our end. Uh, previously, we would require um, individuals to um, sign powers of attorneys, uh, which will entail them to send us the originals. So with the ability to, vis uh, to video sign, we don't need that anymore. So certain things have been streamlined, even though uh, it appears to be a lot more complicated as we are working through the uh, pandemic and the so-called the, um, the lockdown, we are finding video signing uh, very easy to, uh, to use. Okay, uh, thank you. I can just jump it. in here. There's a couple of questions that's been sent to me privately. Okay. Uh, one of the questions yes. is to Shirley. Um, yes. In Toronto, most of the banks require the documents for closing to be uh, a true copy. Banks do not allow virtual signing. How are we handling those on closing? Um, or has I'm it also, been changed? Yeah, I'm finding that a lot of banks are uh, relaxing that requirement also. My concern is not so much for the, uh, the regular banks. Uh, my, my concern are for the... Uh, um, the second tier uh, mortgagees, the private mortgagees, they may want us to explain things personally to the clients. So before we even start, uh, we will ask the mortgagees whether they're prepared to take um, uh, video conferencing and explanations through um, this medium before we proceed. And if for whatever reason they're unable to accommodate us or they, they don't want to accommodate us, then we will fall back to the actual meeting with the clients, provided that they're also comfortable in coming out. Okay, thank you. There's another question here, um, I guess to Ivan or Shirley, um, or I guess Ontario BC might be different. Um, how about probate? Um, so what's happening with uh, probate at the, uh, um, at, at the uh, signing parts? Um, so in BC, the, the all, all, corporate, um, all court proceedings are suspended. Um, you can still file, but for probate applications, uh, you can still file them. Affidavits can be signed, uh, assets, and in terms of real estate um, that are indicated in the, real, the probate application, all that is still can be filed. But it's just the hearings. Um, in probate in BC, you don't have to attend court to get uh, probate orders done. Everything's done by affidavits, which there are virtual um, um, uh, video signing uh, protocols in place for affidavits, which is different than the land title office. Um, when you get the court order from the probate office, uh, you can use that as if it's a form A, as if it's a transfer. So te technically, there is no requirement to actually attend court for probate issues. Um, so, but then if there is anything that needs to be spoken to um, in the probate application, such as a contested uh, beneficiary, um, if the disposition of the real estate is going to be contested, that has to be postponed. So um, that can't be heard and therefore no real estate in a probate application is actually transferred until that's resolved and um, until, until the courts are reopened. Um, and all the court cases that are existing in the system, it doesn't matter what, have been all adjourned. Now, if your case was set for April 3rd, for example, and May 17th, your hearing is going to be reset for another uh, set date. So everything's postponed. Yeah, it, it's uh, very similar to the situation in Ontario. Uh, we wait about six to 12 months anyways for the uh, probate applications to work itself through. So I basically tell my clients, you know, just tack on, tack on a few months and continue to wait. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, uh, Stephen, on your end that no, uh, related to on. this? I think they answered most of it. 
Okay, good. So uh, let's go to the third questions that we all really matters immediately. Do you see, both of you see that a lot of the buyers, they're trying to back out using COVID-19 as an excuse. They say, oh, the market is going down. I'm trying, okay, I try everything. So trying to back out, you know, things like that. So can Shelly start off? Yeah, in Ontario? Yeah, abso yeah, absolutely. You know, in the times of COVID, everyone, there, there's a myth about this COVID. Everyone thinks because of the situation we're in, we can use COVID as an excuse to get out of our legal obligations. But that's not the case. When you sign an agreement of purchase and sale, it's a binding contract between two parties for consideration, there's meeting of the minds, and time is of the essence. So you can't just throw something like COVID and say, well, because of that, I'm not closing. Now, having said that, I received my first letter to request um, uh, an individual to get out of a transaction. And the only excuse that they gave me was because of the virus. So in effect, you know, that's not a valid excuse to get out of a um, agreement of purchase and sale, which is um, still um, a valid contract that has to be fulfilled. So um, I think what's important is for agents to advise their clients that notwithstanding uh, COVID, nothing really changes, nothing really changes. And uh, I, I think the reasons why, um, you know, people think that they can is because all of these agreements were probably signed prior to COVID and uh, it's something new and unusual. And they think because of that, they can, for some reason, get out of their obligations. So Ivan, do you yeah. see that in BC? Yeah, yeah. So some of the uh, some of the cases that have occurred is that someone who lost their job and then therefore their mortgage is being pulled out and they they can't get financing, and it was a subject that had been removed and all of a sudden this hits and they've lost their jobs and then they the the, the lenders are reevaluating their the credit worthiness ability to handle the mortgage and that's a, that's in jeopardy. A second thing that happened that I can talk about later. These are actual cases that I'm working with and working through the system as well is that you have a, a, a sale that was subject to vacant tenancy, okay, vacant possession on the completion date. Uh, the completion date is now gonna be happening during the time in which um, there is a ban on any evictions. So the tenants are saying, hey, if I'm getting out of my house, I have nowhere to go and I can't find another place and I don't wanna move. You can't make me move and that's true. You can't make them move. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue right now. And then in, in a couple of cases that I'm, I'm dealing with right now, the most important thing to know is that is this a reason to be able to say to hey to anyone hey i can't give vacant possession therefore we can't complete that's not true um as uh, shirley had mentioned these are binding contracts uh, there's a couple of concepts that i want to introduce to everyone if nobody's heard of it is that it's a frustration of contract and there are cases mm -hmm. case laws that deals with how to get out of the uh, contracts are binding um, if there's an unforeseen event that comes up that prevents a, a contract from being enforced, um, there's questions about whether that applies or not. The other, the other things we're uh, seeing now, a lot of contracts that are coming in with COVID-19 clauses. Um, in the event of this and this, and the, the subject and possession and completion dates are adjourned until X number of days after the pandemic has been ruled a, a no longer a pandemic. Now, those issues are coming up. Uh, the two things I wanna say uh, about this issue and topic right now is the idea is frustration of contract. Can it or will it or is there a way in which it could apply? Now, pandemics or well, tr traditionally and through the case law that you can find, it's not going to be a good enough reason. The reason is, and the, one of the main points of frustration of contract is that if you had to enforce the contract, would the parties get what they had bargained for? So if the person who didn't want to buy was forced to buy, will they still get what they want if they actually bought? Yes, they get they mm -hmm. get the contract, they get the they get the property, they get what they had bargained for. The, 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 the thing to make it easier to understand is is a situation where you are forced to do something and what you get is completely different than what you had bargained for. And that's what the test is. It has to be a drastic change or difference between what you had bargained for as a result of that unforeseen event happening. Um, you know, and uh, one of the things that I might want to do is on the chat line, 
Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paste up a couple of cases that are in BC. Um, people can look it up. Um, they, they deal with these aspects of trying to break out of a contract, either rental tenancy problems, other financing problems, where all of a sudden they can't buy. So my advice as well, in addition to all of this, is finding. You better find a way. If you can't get the financing, find a way to pool the resources and get people, family to help complete because you are at risk if you can't complete, even if unforeseen events like this happen. Um, one other point about frustration that I want to brought up is that idea is that the unforeseen event has to cause something that's not temporary. We don't know whether it's temporary or permanent right now, but it's not sufficient enough proof and evidence right now to say that it is a permanent thing. No, the flu has been around, the uh, spine flu has been periodically, hasn't been eliminated, but neither has it become a part where it become a, a long lasting and never ending kind of a, a, a health situation that affects workers and financing and completion. So, so yeah. Shelley? Yeah, the only thing I would like to add to that is that, um, you know, with frustration, um, not likely, um, not too much case law. Um, the event must be such that the contract be rendered impossible to be performed. And like Ivan just said, um, you know, even though you've lost your job, it's not impossible to come up with the funds through other means or through other sources. I, I just think you have one example of a, of a just, just to, to to get the concept around it, um, and this is a complicated case, but I just want to sort of briefly talk about it, um, where there was a contract for um, um, to to uh, to buy a. This is a different contract, probably real estate related, but a contract to to um, to install windows on a wall, okay, um, and then for ten thousand dollars, say say for example, and then while they're doing it, they realize that the wall is a retaining wall. You can't build a, a window through the retaining wall, but if you build it, the whole place would fall down because it's a weight-bearing mm -hmm. structure. And what you get is windows on the place that demolished because it all fell down as a result. That's something that's pretty extreme. But the idea is that if you actually enforce the contract with what you get at the end is what you didn't ask for. That's 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 a good mm -hmm. example of that. And it's not okay. inconvenient. It's not more money. Uh, it's not it takes more time. It's, uh, it's not, uh, you know, cost more. Um, it's not, in, not a reason. Okay, great. Now, we do, I, I quickly saw that one of our lenders is, is in, in this group right now. Uh, his name is Gunn. So he mentioned, I saw quickly that there, he is able, he said that there's other lenders is willing to do the funding. So maybe, you know, all of us should, you know, like if we encounter the situations, either find guns on there, you know, talk about that or go back to your lenders and then find out the way to, uh, to do the funding, right? So uh, shall we move on to the uh, um, actually, next? Actually, sorry, oh. Tina, let me just jump in. There's a yes. couple of questions that might be related to this. Um, sure. the, right before close, there's a situation uh, for one of our, sorry, let me just summarize this. Uh, more or less the question is saying, what happens before closing and there's final revisit or home inspection and the homeowner is sick and does not allow anyone to come in? Is that contract still enforceable to be closed on time or can it be delayed? Um, if you don't mind me, I'll just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Now, like visual inspections can still be done virtually. I mean, it's not to physically be there to look at it. You, you need to have a house, a home inspector, um, because after all, it is a visual inspection. It's not busting through walls. It's not looking at inside whole, like the attics and things, but anything that can be visually seen. And you can have the visual, visual um, inspection if needed. Um, it's just not the physical one. Um, it, I, it, it, to me, in my, my reading of the contracts, is not a reason to not complete. The idea of not having a physical inspection is not fundamental enough to not complete. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Ivan. Unless the um, right for inspection is made an integral part of the agreement of purchase and sale, by the uh, virtue of the fact that you cannot gain access for your final visitation, is not sufficient um, to uh, not close. Um, practically, practically, you know, if both parties uh, do want to close, um, you know, you may consider a holdback. Um, and um, you know, after the purchaser gains uh, possession of the premises, if indeed there's something 
that's damaged or not quite right, um, then at least there's a whole back amount that you may be able to offset uh, the repairs from. So I, I have a question, let's go back. So that is good for resale, but how about, you know, pre-sale, you know, uh, you know, final walkthrough, you're not allowed to go. Oh. How do you handle that? Yeah, um, I would like to comment on that. Um, in Ontario, we have something called the Ontario New Home Warranty Program. It's uh, Tarion is their branded name. And Tarion provides in normal times, prior to occupancy, you must have a pre-delivery inspection between the purchaser and the builder. And it's at this time that you document all of the deficiencies, anything that's damaged, um, uh, any little scratch, you put it all down and these deficiencies will be honored by the builder to fix and repair after occupancy. Now, with the onset of the pandemic, that's no longer required. Uh, I know a lot of clients have um, come to me regarding this. They're saying, oh, well, Shirley, you know, I can't do my walkthrough now. Um, can I delay my occupancy? No, you can't. Um, and the reason is, Tarion or the, or the Ontario New Home Warranty Program has suspended that as a requirement for occupancy. So what will happen now is that the builder will do the walkthrough for you. And they will note down all the deficiencies, uh, preferably backed up by video or, um, or pictures. And then when the buyer obtains occupancy of the unit, he or she will do what we call a delivery inspection. So it's no longer a pre-delivery inspection, it's a delivery inspection, again, backed up by video and um, pictures to ensure that uh, if there are any damages that it wasn't caused by the uh, buyer. Okay, so Ivan, uh, BC similar or different? I don't think uh, BC had that requirement of the pre-delivery inspection to be uh, eligible for the enrollment to the national um, home warranty system. That's the, the program that operates here in BC. It doesn't apply, it didn't, didn't yeah. necessarily need that before. Um, so in order to be eligible. So I think the, um, the, the whether there was a pre-inspection or post-inspection or delivery, that it, it, the program is still operative. That the builder has to have that registered, that they, they have the warranty in place, and afterwards, if there's any deficiencies, then it's been either covered or did, uh, built or taken care of by the developer or through the warranty system. Okay, so uh, now I want to so go, then go to the resale, go back to the resale. So mm -hmm. when we have a tenants in the, in the property, you know, like they're not willing to, to go. So, you know, the whole thing, the whole situations, how do we tackle that? Ivan, well, BC? I think uh, the first start to say is that is there uh, an ability to say that your hands are tied because the law, it just came, I can't, I, the, the law came and says I can't take it. I can't force the tenants out. Um, I, I promise, uh, say for example, if you're a vendor, I promise to make in possession. Uh, the buyer goes and says, hey, I, I need this place for my, my family. This, I can't have you have tenants in it. It's a breach of contract. So the first point is that it's not a frustration of contract provision. Um, the idea is that tenants are there, but the, the law is only temporary. There's not going to be a permanent ban on ten tenants not being allowed to be evicted. Secondly, you can actually make an application to the resident ten Residential Tenancy Board here in BC for an order of possession. They can't be enforced until the, the, the ban is out, but as soon as the ban is out, then you can use that order of possession and actually do enforcement. So the enforcement of that, that tenancy eviction is only delayed for a little for time until the, uh, the, the, the emergency uh, ban uh, against eviction is gone. Um, yes. thirdly, the idea is that um, so the idea is that um, because of that situation, uh, the parties um, and I and I and I was listening to um, Shirley's ideas about holdbacks and all that the parties have to be practical. Um, the seller has to know that they are in breach and they can't get out of that breach. Uh, but the buyer also has to know that it's not the fault of the vendor. Um, so at some point they have to come to an agreement, and both sides have to be reasonable. But you know the idea is that, uh, and I'd like to bring up a third concept here before I said I talked about. Um, frustration of contracts and 
and the idea of uh, the, the requirement for it to be met. But one important thing too as well is the cause mitigation. Now, uh, you know, this is the word that'll be um, tossed around when it goes to court, um, but the parties who had or potentially have suffered a loss, what steps did they take to mitigate their loss? And that has to be done. That's, that, that's one of the principles. So if the buyer says, hey, I, I want this house for myself, and um, now that you don't have the, uh, available to have the tenants out, um, I suffer loss and I want damages. Well, what is your loss? What is your compensation? If you decided to say, hey, you know what? I had this other place. Um, I could have lived, stayed there, uh, but I moved out. Um, now I'm going to rent a really expensive apartment downtown and $1,000 a night. Is that mitigation or not? So these things have to be taken into account. So A, the, the vendor is in breach of the contract. It's, it's not their fault, but they're still in breach. Buyer says, well, you know, I suffered loss, but hey, too, um, you can't probably prove what that loss will be based on just the idea that, um, uh, hey, I suffered loss, I, I should be compensated. What is your compensation? Um, the, the idea of mitigation is there. The other idea of mitigation um, in terms of loss and consequences as well is uh, the other the idea of uh, reasonable loss of expectation of gain. What could the buyer have gained? What did they lose? So if at the time in which the breach happened, um, what could they have lost? So quite often the reasonable thing they do is look at the contract price and what is the value of the property at the time in which the breach occurred. Probably there's a month or two maybe um, in terms of normal sale, resale market. Um, the property didn't probably go up or down. And in fact, it probably went down because of the market. So the buyer has to be beware. Um, you don't just get whatever you ask for. Okay. And Shelly? Okay. Yes. My comment here is this. Um, no matter what, we always try to save the transaction. And uh, tenants not moving out can occur at any time, not necessarily during, you know, the COVID times. Uh, we've uh, faced these issues, you know, even before COVID. So in terms of how do we save the deal, I will firstly look at who am I representing, the vendor or the buyer? And also looking at the market um, situation. Um, what's the state of the market right now? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? In whose favor has it gone in favor of? Now, three possible solutions very practically uh, we can extend the transaction until the tenant moves out. Um, the buyer, if he really wants the property, he can actually assume the tenant. Um, the vendor, if he, if he really wants to sell, and this actually is a solution that I'm working with right now, if you really want to sell, um, money talks. I have a situation where the seller has offered the tenant a sum of money to move out. And they're in the negotiation part right now as to you know, how that's going to come, up, come about. Um, another practical solution, and I'm not you know, just tossing this out, but uh, sometimes maybe both parties should consider maybe an adjustment of the purchase price um, to represent the... Um, the lost opportunity or um, to avoid uh, extended litigation. Um, so that's a possibility. So um, in terms of how I deal with tenants, I approach it very practically. And if indeed uh, my client is the purchaser and he's not prepared to do any of these, then um, basically the um, vendor has uh, breached their obligations to provide a vacant possession. And, um, you know, we can tender and then see what flows from there. Okay, okay, so one great. Other, oh, okay, Ivan. Thing, one other point I wanna make out then um, is the idea that what are the uh, remedies that can be available to the okay. buyer? Um, the unlikely to be able to, if the contract if the buyer really wants this property and really wants it to be vacant, uh, one of the things that can, the, a term that has been thrown around is um, that you can hear about and people talking about is something called specific performance. performance yeah. um, can you force the deal to go through? Can you, can you later on make the seller sell the house back to you later on when all the situation has changed? 
um, it's pretty unlikely. It's very hard uh, because the property has to be so unique that there's no other alternative replacement property that the buyer can actually use as, as a substitute. And it's pretty hard to, to get that uniqueness down to a point where you can actually force the seller to sell later on down the line. So if you really, really want that property, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer out there, um, work at these reasonable steps between you and the, the seller. Um, as those, those great ideas that Shirley had mentioned uh, about how to deal with this practically. Great. So, uh, Stephen, on your side, do you have any questions before? Uh, because we, we have so many Americans buddies over here. So, you uh, know, like. No, I don't have any private, but I think there is a question if you scroll up to the second last Yeah, one, actually, uh, uh, is it Garrick? Garrick, you got it. something? Garrick, okay, we have California people, you know, like we have so many Hawaii, we have so many of our buddies over here. So, you know, like we can, we can just share. This is not just about Canada, you know, like us as well so maybe garrick you want to share with us about you know your situations over in uh, in san francisco and things like that garrick yang is from uh, our area in in the, uh, san francisco we have just just um a lot of challenges as well especially i'm uh, just hearing the conversations about tenants you know tenants being affected by loss of income landlords being stuck you know cannot collect cannot evict cannot you know, do things and, you know, we're given reassurance by our government that we could have forbearance or, you know, delay, but even those terms are different from uh, servicer to servicer. So we share a lot of uh, unknowns and challenges as well, just like in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, did I, did I hear any things that uh, California is now uh, uh, trying to, you know, like, force a law and things like that about 25% reductions on rent or somewhere in California. I can't remember. I, I was reading. I haven't heard things. that, but uh, maybe a moratorium on rent increases like a rent freeze. <coughs> uh, so, you know, it's, it, it's harsh because it's, uh, you know, controlling the landlord, but you know, at the time like this, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense that a landlord be increasing rent either. We all understand, uh, you know, economics, but we also have to have some humanity too. They yeah. they are they are trying to um, have the Bay Area reduce twenty five percent of the thing. I think C A R N A R is working on stopping it. I know our local Sacramento is trying to stop the that that uh, um, proposal. It's, yeah, that proposal. It, there's a number on it. I'll send you the link on it, uh, Tina, for that Great. for the twenty five percent rent de decrease thing. I'll send yeah. you the link through Messenger. Sure. Right. You know, this like, is we can uh, share. <laughs> Amy, this is Amy, Amy. our Aria elect. Hi, Amy. Elect. Hi. <laughs> A lot of Amy would know more. My Canadian friends here. My goodness. So, um, hi. Nice meeting you, Stephen. <laughs> okay. So uh, that twenty-five percent uh, rent reduction is proposed by our uh, <laughs> uh, crazy people down in uh, Sacramento, which is our headquarter to the entire California. So uh, that is a proposal on the table and uh, ARIA is working closely with our California Association of Realtor and same as the National Association of Realtor to try to uh, get that done. And uh, of course, there are many different uh, legislature coming up uh, starting from California and ripple down to the rest of the country. So, uh, so far, uh, what I've heard uh, from Canada, Vancouver, you guys are still in very good shape. <laughs> so. <laughs> But uh, that's something that what ARIA is all about. You know, we would fight for whatever that will help the yes. uh, AAPI homeownership rates. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Um, Shelly. Yeah. Yes, something I would like to share is that uh, I know we're, we're focusing more on uh, residential right now, but the situation with commercial leases um, up in Ontario, it's beginning to, to rear itself. Um, a lot of commercial tenants have been unable to pay their April um, rental as it becomes due on April the 1st. Um, up in, yeah, up in Canada, um, once you don't pay commercial rent for 15 days, uh, the landlord has the right to uh, lock you out. And uh, that's what's been happening. Um, I don't know um, how much longer 
the lockdown will be, but if this progresses, um, unfortunately, we will see a lot of small businesses uh, lose their place and um, it's become quite um, uh, concerning for a lot of the small businesses in Ontario right now. Um, it's um, more dire for them, uh, at least for the residential tenants. They have been given some reprieve because there are no evictions based on non-payment of rent, but not the same kind of protection has been extended for our uh, commercial tenants. Yeah. Um, Ivan? Yeah, I'd like to comment a little bit more than, than like my, like uh, Shirley, that that issue has been coming up quite a lot in the last month or so. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, quite a number of landlord clients who are now we're negotiating with the uh, the tenant lawyers to find a result um, that's uh, amenable to both. Um, instead of having a vacant property with no rent whatsoever mm -hmm. coming in, um, partial rent, uh, similar to how loans and banks are allowing deferrals. Um, I have some landlord clients who are deferring part of the rent. It's not that it's forgiven. It's just that yeah. whenever everything's over, we can uh, not charge you, we're not, we're not gonna call this a breach of the lease, we make an agreement. Uh, some of the, my landlord clients have a look at their mortgage payments and say, hey, at least you pay them my cost. Um, you, you almost like pay the triple net part, uh, but okay, forego on the basic rent part, um, at least for a month or two. And, and making arrangements that are reasonable, like. We'll, we'll do that for three months and we'll look at it again later on. Uh, those are being reasonable and trying to accommodate both parties. Um, if for a landlord who relies on the rental income, that's a bit difficult if that's all they have in terms of how they make the money, then vice versa for tenants as well. Um, one of the things that I started to look for on leases, which I drafted with clients, is whether they have a force majeure clause attached mm -hmm. or not. Now, I put that on the chat room and Tax box as to a concept um, that you don't normally find in real estate contracts, but it's starting to be there now. Um, mm -hmm. The idea is that you have a, a provision that allows a notice to be given at a certain time frame. Um, if there is a pandemic, for example, which is a normal kind of peril, uh, which is found inside these clauses, which allows um, either the suspension or the of uh, the con uh, obligations um, for a certain time frame or even its cancellation of obligations altogether. Um, so these exist and they're quite, um, you can find them in a lot of commercial leases. You don't find them a lot in purchase uh, residential at all, period. Um, even in now, um, nowadays. So th that's an important concept to look at. Okay, so uh, Stephen, is there a, a you know, uh, There's a question for, from, from uh, Linda to Shirley. Uh, yeah. Shirley, what was the time period for commercial rent default? 15 days, if not otherwise stated in the commercial lease. Okay, maybe mm -hmm. I could share a little bit of my own experience that in commercial real estate, um, our firm does quite a lot of commercial real estate. We're actually getting a lot of our uh, bigger landlords in Toronto. They're actually- <laughs> Okay, got it. <laughs> it was all of a sudden like, oh, uh, went, oh yeah. your mic, uh, your mic. This? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's been a lot of bigger landlords out there been reaching out to the smaller tenants and waiving their fees um, or even giving them a 50% discount. Um, that's what we've been seeing probably in the last three weeks. Uh, came across my desk probably. I've seen about 90 deals like that uh, where the landlord actually initiated the chat with the tenant. So I think uh, if you're a landlord or a tenant right now, maybe that's a conversation you should have with your uh, landlord. Great. So another thing that I want to, uh, since we are in a little bit of a commercial space, uh, James, are you here? James Wen, our national president. Hello. He's yes, here. I'm here. Sorry, oh, my phone, uh, computer shut down. Sorry. So, so since we are in the commercial space and James is, uh, is in the commercial world uh, in U.S., do you see any of this, you know, like the rent situations and then, you know, whatnot? Can, can you share a little bit? with us about what is going yes. on in California or just commercial in general in US? Yeah, so, so everything that you've been saying has been also happening in the US where we were all very curious what would happen April 1st. And like many, many people did not pay. We, we Across the board, a lot of the our large landlord uh, just showed that maybe 30 to 40% of the tenants just did not pay 
or they sent a letter about uh, asking for deferments or adjustments. So many uh, commercial real estate uh, products are um, working it out, mostly on the retail. Retail and even some industrial, uh, and a lot of times we just have to work through it, but there was no forbearance or anything else except for the tenants. But uh, the payments and everything else, it, it kind of trickled to the banks where now we're negotiating with the banks trying to you know, trying to get some help also on these type of projects. So right now, uh, as you can probably see with a lot of stocks and a lot of large portfolios of commercial real estate, it's being affected in a very big way that you don't have the protection like the residential. So everyone is actually looking at probably defaults and everything happening in the commercial sooner than the residential wow. this year. So do you see that there will be a lot of opportunities to buy the commercial? I mean, obviously you need a lot of money to buy. It doesn't matter how much they <laughs> drop, but do you see a lot of, uh, you know, which, which area that you see in U.S. that may be, you know, uh, potential good buy <laughs> later on? Yeah, well, the, the hard problem is the finance, the banking needs to get back online too, because that's the issue that there's so much uncertainties, the financiers, and a lot of banks or capital markets are not functioning well right now. And they would rather not lend at all or make it very hard to lend. So the people that already have money could buy the opportunities, but the ones that are looking for financing probably cannot get it. Are we going back to right uh, 2008 right, situation? Uh, are we going back to like 2008? There's a lot of Yeah, well, there's so much uncertainty. People don't real they don't have a good grasp on it. They just know that uh, there will be opportunities, but the problem is, can you finance it? Can you get these opportunities done? And, and the most affected are where people congregate and what's being shut down, like the retail, student housing, senior housing, uh, the ones that are not as impact are data centers, medical uh, situations, medical office, medical buildings, uh, hospitality, very hit a very hard because some of them are coronavirus centric right being protective and the distancing and also being sensitive to the economic downturn which we're all feeling there's going to be a global downturn or reset or maybe um kind of a a, a w right and going down again so so right now the thing is everyone's being very cautious everyone's saving their powders everyone's making costs everyone's trying to work it out deferring uh, whatever they can to make sure that once everything stabilizes, we can kind of get back to kind of a new normal of certainty of how are we going to come out of this. But on the commercial real estate, we are a little more worried uh, because there is no grants, government bailouts, and protection on commercial real estate. So I, I, I'm hearing the same thing in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, once we get this, I mean, I like, hopefully we can. You know, like U.S. is is opening up a lot faster. Looks like, because you guys are talking about you know end of the month or maybe sometimes in May, uh, you're gonna start opening up. So Canada, we don't know yet. So we will see how this play out because your economy, obviously, the China and the U.S. economy is 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 the world is looking at it. It's basically it's U.S. and uh, China's economy, and how this will affect ours. So Ivan. Yeah, share with us I'd like to, to add a little bit is that you know normally in most um, insurance contracts pandemics are not a covered peril it's not like an earthquake and it's not like um, fire or, or physical damage to properties of rental premises so rent can be probated uh, prorated it, that doesn't happen but there are some insurance companies i think now are developing products that are applicable but um you know you can't buy pandemic insurance <laughs> it's just, and unfortunately, you think it's a loss of rental income, and you look at your rider and your insurance, it doesn't cover it. So unfortunately, but you know, there are different insurance products that can help in some other areas and aspects. Um, you know, um, so the idea is that right now, more than ever, it's important is to look at the insurance products that are available. Um, it, it's probably too late to look at your contract that you have already gotten for your insurance. Um, but going forward, it's certainly something to think about. Okay, great. So we have five minutes to go. Uh, any other questions or else, you know, we can also talk about, um, you know, like the, uh, the pre-sale, the constructions, um, you know, assignments, you know, like, 
is there any assignment issues that is going on? You know, like some of the people, they pay obviously higher, trying to, you know, flip the property for assignment. And now in the situations, do they want to get out and walk away? So Ivan, do you see that? Um, I not in this this little time period. Uh, mostly, if there's that situation, it's not for someone who's trying to assign, um, trying to sell it in the market. It's just that they have problems when it comes to um, uh, a spouse or a family member who um, is out of work, and how can they afford this? On the anticipation that they're going to be able to afford that rent, uh, they'll pay for the mortgage payments as well as um, a find a tenant. Um, but that reasonable prospect you're completing now with no expectation that maybe you'll be able to uh, afford the, the mortgage payments. And that's hard on a lot of the buyers and pre-sale markets. But I haven't seen many people who intentionally were thinking about buying um, these things in order to find a, uh, an assignment market um, uh, for their pre-sale. And Shelley? No, I'm not finding any issues there. Okay. I'm not finding any issues with assignments. In fact, I am seeing a few more assignment these days. Right. So uh, I don't think the, um, the, the COVID has impacted that part of the market at all. Okay, great. So we have Winston, uh, who is the big boy <laughs> in, in uh, Toronto, uh, representing Tridel. Is there any things that you can share with us that you see? Well, uh, uh, first, um, echoing uh, 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 both lawyer, we were talking about a commercial challenge too, but I, I think Canada also announced a, a commercial rent re relief. Uh, to uh, the small business uh, side, uh, small and medium sized business. Have you two hear anything about the specific about this type of assistance? Well, um, what I've heard about it, and I haven't looked at it further, but it's like um, supplementing in, in small businesses that are business owners um, about the wage, um, helping helping cover some part of their the the, the, the cost. In which to pay their employees. Um, there's a certain, I think, I believe the the reduction of income has to be like a 15% reduction of mm -hmm. income in order for them to qualify um, for that wage subsidy part. Um, right. I think no. The wage. Yeah. No, I'm 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 referring to the new one that he then um, Justin Trudeau announced it yesterday. It's the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistant. That was announced yesterday it's, and I, I it's think what they're working on right now is uh, from the federal and the provincial level um they're actually working out because every province apparently is different i'm actually posting right. a link on the chat right now yeah. it actually explains it pretty well about this they don't have the exact numbers yet right yeah. but they're more looking at about the ten thousand dollar range for rent right. for small businesses right. right yeah so in terms of uh, the developer side too uh are we affected uh Yes, but not as big as what we anticipated. Uh, construction front, we're still ongoing uh, because we were fortunate, uh, like real estate agent, we are a essential service and as long as it's Ontario, we have a broke bay permit and we'd be able to still continue. And having said that, of course, we uh, still needed to go uh, to extra precaution, like what you do on a daily basis. And in terms of the con construction protocol, uh, the sanitization, the, the safety, um, the, the ability to get worker to work safely in a safe environment too. Uh, we were fortunate because of our strength and experience that we were uh, quite advanced on, on that uh, protocol anyway. So uh, the, we would uh, selected to be one of the few builder that still can continue. Um, but in, in the long run too, that will be predicate on, you know, maybe the, the supply side too. Um, the number of workers, no, mat no matter how safe we were, uh, the psychological factor, if our team member decide not to work or unit member decide not to work, uh, we just have to respect that. And I, I think for us in an organization, what we focus on right now is the health and safety for our team member, our purchaser, and our, our partner like, like here. So uh, on that note, uh, we are still operating approximately 80% of our, our construction forces. Um, in terms of, of uh, the, the closing uh, to uh, Shell, I uh, actually what Shell was saying too, because we have Tarian, uh, and then our, con our customer care, the brand experience team, uh, actually doing the uh, pre-delivery inspection on behalf of the purchaser. And because of the, um, the assurance of uh, Tarion and by our own company to uh, purchaser are also continue to take occupancy. Uh, so uh, on that note, uh, we were grateful. Uh, and um, 
the, the long term effect we don't know, but in, in immediate we are still okay. And sales size, we move it uh, basically uh, all uh, uh, virtual now. Uh, we do have a couple of sales team members here too, uh, together with uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, two, uh, we still um, move our, our sales operation uh, virtually. And uh, we also still continue to do sales too. We, we just did um, a deal last week, uh, totally virtual. So um, uh, we, uh, we kind of brace for impact, but we don't really uh, see the impact yet. But having said that, it's still too early to, to see uh, whatever you see on the market too. And I think it's only a measurement of uh, the strength of the restriction, not necessarily uh, the, the true uh, dynamics of the market. So, um, yeah, so what we do is to just stay put and make sure everybody is healthy and get ready when everything back to normal. Okay, great. So um, we really appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, great information we've been getting, you know, on the chat room saying that great contents and things like that. So uh, whoever are not uh, our ARIA member yet, uh, join us. We would like to get more of this content, especially right, right now. Uh, you know, when we're all at home and gets all these, uh, you know, like global, we get all the global people here so we can all learn from each other. Uh, we're going to send out, uh, you know, information about our, um, uh, the link to join uh, if you're not our members yet so that, you know, like right now it's like $25, like, yes, it's US dollars, but then, you know, you're going to be able to uh, join our uh, global luxury summit virtual one this first time that is going to be on 29th from 12 p.m. PST to 2.30 uh, PST. So, you know, join us and then there will be a lot more for you to learn. It will be the best $25 you could ever invest in yourself and uh, for that uh, two and a half, just even just for that two and a half hours. So Garrick and James and everybody else, uh, Amy and Don Pingero, you guys are here. Anything else? Uh, want to say something before we Hi, wrap it up? Our honorary Canadian, Adon, please. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say hello to all my Canadian friends. We miss you. Can't wait to be back in Toronto and Vancouver soon enough. Uh, summer's here. Hopefully we can loosen things up uh, for our travel and uh, get the ARIA family back together again very soon. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. So Amy, uh, we will see her later on because we cannot see her face and she is going to be our 2021 uh, national president. And James, uh, has he gone and he's our, our current one so as you know so thank you very much everybody we have this in recording so we will send this to every single one of us here so you can share it and and then you know like just check it out everything's all again thank you so much everybody appreciate it thank you thank you bye right. thank, thank you. you see you all soon yeah. bye bye bye, bye.